Cool. I'll take that as a yes. Developing the inverse deri trig derivative. So let's go with this. An example is um, develop the derivative or y equal, well, let's go inverse tangent of x. Notice it says develop. It doesn't say recall. So if you think, oh, I know that's 1 over 1 plus x squared, that's great. That would get you a minus 1 on the homework, and on the test, maybe it would get you 1 out of 4. Grabbing the right answer without actually answering the question. It says develop, not recall. Develop. So this, then, is the process I would like you to show. When I write you a note on a box that says develop, I would like you to show the implicit word. All inverses, derivatives, can be found. All inverse derivatives can be found implicitly. Just not just inverse anything, inverse anything. So let's go here. Y equals inverse tangent of x. Isn't that the same as tangent of y equals x? Those are equivalent. They're the same. Now I'm going to take the derivative with respect to x of both sides. I take the derivative on the left side with respect to f now, implicit differentiation. What's the derivative of tangent of y using chain rule? So the derivative of the outside, second squared y, but by then chain rule, derivative of the inside. Derivative of y with respect to x is y dx. And the derivative on x with respect to x is 1. one. Don't overthink. Okay. Um, there are two ways to go from there. I could either say dy dx is 1 over secant squared, or perhaps even cleaner would be just to say plain old cosine squared. Cosine squared. Ready? Of what? Cosine squared of what? Am I done? You are not done. The original problem was in terms of x. So the derivative should be in terms of x. So great. I want to replace cosine of y with something like this. What the heck? How do I do it? Well, you draw. If tangent of y equals x was the original relationship, then is y an angle or a side? An angle. And what are the sides implied by tangent of y equals x? Can you agree that x is the same as x over 1? What is tangent the ratio? Opposite to adjacent. So opposite is x and adjacent is 1. Okay. But I want to talk about what cosine is. Well, isn't cosine the ratio of adjacent to hypotenuse? What's adjacent? 1. And the hypotenuse. By Pythagorean theorem, what's the hypotenuse? 1 squared plus 1 square root. And so what is all that in a square? 1 over x squared. All right. Now then, to sum up the big ideas, you first of all rearrange. You take the derivative implicitly. And then you draw a triangle to put back into x terms. Put back 
terms of it. Let's have you try the one on the whole word. I'll pause on the notes for a second. I'll come back to this. Number 11 on the front, which is this homework is a set, a mixture of set 69 and 70, so be careful. 11 on the front is 6911. And 6911 says to find the derivative of arc sine of x squared. So in box 11, on the front, would you just bound up the derivative of our sign of x squared? Three calls. I'll find it. I need it probably. It probably. So, using the first three big ideas, what's the first thing I do? Rearrange, rearrange. What is that? Yeah, think of it as doing the inverse to both sides. The inverse of arc sine is sine, so sine of y equals sine of arc sine, which is just x squared. Cool. All right, so that's your rearranged. Do not worry about square rooting, it's not necessary. All right, now let's take the derivative. What's the derivative of the left with respect to y? X. Cosine y dy dx. What's the derivative of the right with respect to x? 2x. Did you differentiate correctly? Cool. Did you solve for dy dx? 2x over cosine of y. Yes. Okay. Here's the part that uh, is a little funky, 
Um, again, if you're thinking this is so stupid, Miss Cannon, I, did Miss Cannon make you do all this or no? Okay, great. That's Patricia, your top one teacher. I'm your top two teacher, and I have to teach you trig sub. To teach you trig sub, you have to be able to do this triangle. Okay, so while it might feel like I'm making your life harder, I have a reason to make you do all this. It's not pointless. It has a reason. It's to get you a skill that you'll need later. All right, so bear with me. Um, now, we need to draw the triangle. We don't draw the triangle based on cosine of y. We draw the triangle based on the original rearranged. So y is the angle, and x squared is a side, or x squared over 1 is a side ratio. What side? x squared is opposite, and the uh, hypotenuse is 1, which makes the adjacent side what? 1 minus, one minus x squared square root, okay? Yeah. Okay, with that said then, I can replace cosine of y based on that triangle. What's the cosine of the angle? Adjacent to hypotenuse, so for total. Square, root square root of 1 minus x squared over 1, technically, which doesn't mean anything. With the appropriate understood? Okay, cool. Uh, let's go the other way. Inverse trig is hybrid. This also might get into unfamiliar territory. I don't know. I can't remember how far she went, and I didn't ask her to learn. So, easy would just be to recall 1 over 1 plus x squared. Antiderivative is <coughs> inverse tangent. Does it matter if I write r tangent or tangent with the rate? No, it doesn't matter. Okay? The other one is 1 over root 1 minus x squared. Is that equal to r sine? Okay. Tangent and sine are the ones that are most basic. You should have those into your noggin. There is an arc secant, but I don't commit that to memory because we'll do that with trig. Yeah. Where? 2x here? No, In the problem? Yeah. Uh, no, 2x would be a u sub problem and there would be a power rule. No. Is there a note saying something else? No, oh, that was x squared. Keep in mind, we did the derivative of arc sine of x squared. That's, that's why that's good. Uh, good. Oh, that's good that your memory is. All right, so a medium level difficulty would be when you have to little do a little bit of this plus maybe a little use of. Okay, so for example, if you have something like um, 3x over... Uh, 1 minus x to the 4th dx. Okay? Now, the, my first temptation is to think u sub, not kind of some kind of inverse trig function. But do you agree this is not an inverse or a u sub kind of problem? Because if I let u equal 1 minus x to the 4th, what should I see up here? Mm -hmm. x to the 3rd, the power rise is just not there, and there's no way around it. It's just not happening. So, U sub is a great first inclination, but if you know. Instead, I feel more like, is this some kind of form of arc sine? Let me think more generally than just x. That's arc sine of u. All right? Okay, so if I could just figure out how is this working, does this fit the blueprint? Well, let's start here. If this is true, then it looks like u squared is x to the fourth. Yeah? If I'm going to really say this is an arc sine problem, then I need to figure out, all right, what's that being squared? And that's x squared squared, okay? So it feels like it might be okay with u equals x squared, what about the top? What's If u is x squared, then what's du? 2x mm -hmm. dx. Okay. So it's starting to take shape because the x dx is there. The 2, not so much. And the 3 is 
kind of grows. But those are coefficients we can work around. Now the x, there's nothing to do there. We, the x's have to be true, all right? So tell me, how can I play around with the 3 and the 2 to make this happen? What should I do with the 3? Pull it up front. Do you agree that a coefficient can be brought up front? Okay? Cool. Um, that means I have x dx. Isn't x dx the same as du over 2? Okay? So in place of this x dx, I could put du over 2, and I might as well put the 2 out there. Yeah. You with me? Okay. And below, 1 minus x to the 4th is 1 minus x to the 4th. We said it's the same as u squared, okay? So if I then take the antiderivative, I got a, the blueprint of the basic formula for arc. The antiderivative of the inside is arc sine of u. And then what do I have to do at the end? Plug in what u is, 3 halves arc sine of x squared. All right, you with me so far? Yeah. All right. Um, let's go to. Maybe we'll use the back here. All right. So, would you start by saying something like, uh, let's go 4 over. 7 plus x squared, oops, 7 plus 3x squared. Yeah. Okie dokie. So we have to work through all the coefficient mumbo jumbo. Uh, first, though, let me say this. If I had an x up here, what would your approach be? If I had an x in the numerator? That would be u sub, and they'd probably give you a natural log of something, right? Uh, because there's not an x up there, it's not u sub, I think, okay, maybe this is that point the arc tangent. Uh, let's nibble away at it. That 4 is a non-issue. I could definitely move that out front, and that's not a problem, okay? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Now, what is a problem is the 7. 7 is a problem. It needs to be 1. What can I do to make that one? You can factor out that 7. If I, I don't know whether I should do this. If I factor out a 7, I have to do it from both terms. So if I factor a 7 out of 7, I'm left with 1. Cool. If I factor a 7 out of 3x squared, what is it? 3 7 x squared. You got 3. So that I could call this 4 sevenths times 1 over 1 plus 3 sevenths x squared dx. Cool. Now that's almost the blueprint for our sign or our king. Our king is the one with some and no root. So um, this is where it goes to where you might take shortcuts, but I am slow-witted, so I need to go slow. This is my u squared. u squared is 3 sevenths x squared. Therefore, u is square root of 3 sevenths x. And du then is root 3 sevenths dx, which implies that dx is root 7 thirds u. Sorry, I just got to be careful. So with my changes then, I have the 4 seventh. It's cool. With my substitution, the 1 over 1 plus is still there. And in place of 3 seventh x squared, I throw 3 squared. And what goes in place of the dx? The d root 7 over 3 
to you. Follow? All right. So that when I anti-differentiate, I get something like four sevenths root seven thirds arc. What? Tangent of u plus c. And what is the antiderivative? Or sorry, what do I put in place of u? What do I put in in place of u? Three sevenths. Okay. A lot of details there to play around with. Um, can we do one more ugly one? Go to the back. Okay. Um, ugly inverse trig integral requiring. Integration, or not integration by parts, requiring completing the square. You're going to love it. Okay, so imagine if you're given the problem dx over x squared plus 4x. Now, before today, you would have been at an impact because there's nowhere to go to. But with a little thinking, you could get out of the impasse by doing a little completing the square. Your idea is you want to get to this, then your whole plea, eh? Well, surely that implies then that you need to complete the square to make this x stuff a perfect square. So, what goes here? Plus 4. Now, surely we need to balance. There are lots of ways to balance. When you add, you could add to both sides, which there is no other side, so I guess that's out. Or instead of balancing with both sides, you could add and subtract. Do you agree that equation or that expression is down? So, this thing. Where's this equivalent to? dx on top and the denominator. x plus 2 squared minus 4, and that's not good. Because now you're looking at our speaking and you don't know how to do it. Too much. Uh, we'll come back to this when we have trig sub. Pause that for a second. This is going to get into be too much for one day. Sorry. Pause that. Come back to that later. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, I will touch on that. So we're at special limit cases. These are totally unrelated. This is set 70. Um, this, limit as x goes to 0, of 1 over x, what possible answer or answers? What is it? The only thing you can see in multiple choice is does not exist. Okay? What about the limit as x goes to 0? of 1 over x squared. Possible answers are does not exist or infinity. Why? Why is this one stone cold does not exist, no other? The one-sided limits are not the same. And so there is no infinity because it's not infinity on both sides. It's just straight up does not exist. The one-sided limits are different, period, no way around it. This one, you could have two possible answers because, although yes, does not exist is a possibility because technically the limit isn't a number, so there is no limit of the y values, um, you could however say infinity because in this case the one-sided limits are different. Cool? 
Okay, uh, let's go to another small, these are all, this is kind of little limit problems. The limit as x goes to 0 of sine of 1 over x. As x goes to 0, which is 1 over x go to, and our x goes to undefined d and e depending on the right or the left. Um, let's go here. This is the same as, let's, let's just make it positive actually. Let's stop positive. Okay. Um, this is the same as the limit as u goes to, if I let u equal 1 over x, and as x goes small positive, u goes big positive, and 1 over x is 2. Well, you could say then that that first question is the same as what's the limit as u goes to infinity of sine of u. What is the limit as sine u goes to infinity of sine of u? What single y value is approached? Uh, or none of them. Does not exist. Now, there are two that cases why a limit doesn't exist. One is because the left hand, right hand limits are different. But another case is by oscillation. If I said, what y value does this graph approach? Well, it doesn't approach a y value. It approaches or bounces back and forth, oscillates between ways. And so that would be D and E by oscillation. All right. Um, three famous limits I want you to recognize right away. The limit as x goes to 0 of sine of x over x. You've done that a million times. You've done a table for it. If you need L'Hopital's rule, you can use L'Hopital's rule on it. Does anybody remember what that goes to? 1. You could use a table to verify. The limit as x goes to 0 of cosine of x minus 1 over x. That also is 0 over 0, but with a little, uh, you could do some limit work on that or a table, but you would know what that goes to. All right, that goes to 0. In the last, you've seen quite a bit. Some of you still don't have it down, but the limit as x goes to 0 of absolute value of x over x. It's kind of important. What is it? It does not exist because... Yeah, the limit from the left. If you take small negatives, the top is positive, the bottom is negative, but the numbers are the same, so that will always approach negative 1, because the numbers are the same. It's either going to be 1 or negative 1. The question is, what are the signs? If you approach 0 from the right, what's that equal to? 1. All right. So let me see how broadly you can think. What about the limit as x goes to 2? Oh. Um... um x minus 2 squared, square root over x minus 2. Does not exist. As you approach from the left, what is that equal? Negative 1. As you approach from the right, what is that equal? Positive 1. This is just like that case where it's, this is the same thing, except Square root and square makes positive. So this is a lot like absolute value. Square then square root is actually the same root around before absolute value is around. Is like absolute value. All right. And then I think I'm going to blow off the proof of sign. I'm going to let that go. All right. Um, that should do. So, your homework is now from the book. Don't forget to take the book home or take pictures of it as you sometimes do. Uh, and let's talk questions on the homework. How did the homework go? Okay. 
I gotta say, uh, I I have not seen as many people as I typically do for help before school and in seven. I the kid is going crazy turning down questions in seven and questions in seven pages. I think that is not the good history. Um, and that is the only six person that came in before school. So if you're sitting there going, oh, I am dying, why, why don't I see you for help? I, that doesn't make sense to me, okay? Um, so let's go. What the, do you want answers or you just know you have questions on something? I can probably scan this and put the answers up during the passing period before seven. Is there something you, do you want answers or questions? Just go to questions. Questions, okay, hit me. Five? Ten heard? Is that true? Five, seventeen, eleven? Five, fifteen, there's no seventeen, sorry. Eleven? Two? Okay, left two. What? Four? Okay. Sixteen? Ten? Eight? Okay, so this is looking like a lot. Um, I'll tell you what, this is what I'm going to do. I will put my key online and you can turn it in tomorrow so you can go over your questions and figure out corrections. We'll do as much as we can right now. Understood? So when is this homework due? Tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow. I will put the key on um, and you can figure out what you're doing wrong. So, five. Five, the area between. So the curve is this guy. Y equals zero between zero and three. Uh, one of the first issues I see talking to some people is that they're having a hard time defining the region. I totally understand that that graph is unfamiliar. It is in your best interest to try and try and struggle with that a little bit before you just pick up the calculator. So I would think, well, I know that the top is a zero and the bottom has no zeros. Why not? It's always positive. And in terms of end behavior, this goes to, as x goes to infinity, y goes to? Nah. More power than value. Yeah. Zero. Okay, so it goes to zero. In terms of signs, it's below when x is negative, above, so I feel like it does something like that. Now here's an interesting thing. I can tell you, you're going to go to college and a professor's going to expect you to be able to think your way through that. They're not, most colleges don't use a graphing type. They expect you to be able to graph is by thinking. So you need to practice that. Y equals zero, that is the x-axis, and between zero and three is here. So I am, that range is what I'm looking for. Okay? It feels like one area, so I can do this with one integral. The limits of integration are given, zero to three. And wouldn't you agree that if I just use straight up f of x dx, it'll be positive because f of x is positive and dx is positive. Okay? All right. Integration technique. Should I continue with the problem to set up or the antiderivative technique? Should I continue? Okay. So do you feel our canyon or do you feel useful? U sub. When you say U sub, do you actually U sub this, changing everything, or do you just kind of uh, mentally U sub it? There's two schools of thought. Actually U sub? Okay, cool. All right. Head up. So, what did you let U equal? X squared plus 1. DU is 2x dx. Um, so, again, trying to match what you do, what do you do with that 2 then? You multiply by 3, so you would then say 3 du's is equal to 6x dx's. That makes sense to me. Okay, so cool. We're in here, we're good. This is 3 du's, that's a u. Now we need to change the limits. If you 
do something like this and say, oh, I didn't change the limits. I just anti-differentiated and changed them back. Is that okay? 100% no. That is atrocious calculus. I will nail you on that big time. If you do a U-sub on a definite integral, you doggone well better change the limits. I don't care if you sub back. If you ever write this without changing the limits, I will nail you. Now, if you go off to the side and say, I don't, I don't want to change the limits. I'm going to anti-differentiate this. You call this 3 natural log of u, and then sub back, and then say, so this is 3 log of x squared plus 1 from 0 to 3. In other words, do an antiderivative without changing. Is that okay? 100% fine. You never lied to me. You said, hey, I'm going to do this antiderivative, and then I'm going to bring that antiderivative back. But the minute you write this, you said this equals that. It doesn't. You lie. You are terrible. Okay? So either do definite integral and go in whole hog baby and change the limits, or do the antiderivative off to the side, but never do a mixture of u sub without changing the limits. That's terrible, terrible, terrible calculus. Understood? Is it clear that I have strong feelings about it? Excellent. Okay, so did you change the limits or did you do the antiderivative off to the side and then bring the antiderivative back with the old limits? Okay, cool. What did the limits change to? I'm sorry, what was the lower limit? 1, 2, 10. Perfect. Okay, so did you get an antiderivative of 3 natural log of u from 1 to 10? Yes. Okay. So that's 3 natural log 10 minus 3 natural log 1. Natural log 1 is a 0. So just 3 natural log 10 or natural log of 1,000, if you like. Are we cool? All right. Um, 15. 15 is, uh, I oh, yeah, 15. If you can graph it, I'm, I'm, it's not just me being visual. If you can graph it, it's really going to help you. Sine of 2x, that has a period of what? 5. Okay? Um, what about cosine of x? What's the period of that? 2 pi. So it's more like this and this. Okay? So between pi over 6 and 5 pi over 6, I'm not, that's in there somewhere, but I'll come to that in a second. All right, are you with me so far? We need to find the intersection points. You might have had problems figuring out where they meet. What's the key to getting unstuck there? Use un I then key. What is sine of 2x equal to? Two sine of x, cosine of x equals cosine of x. Tell me, good math to divide out a cosine? Terrible math to divide out a cosine. You never divide out a function. You use solutions that way, just like this. How many solutions are there? Two. Zero squared equals itself, and one squared equals itself. And if you divide out an x, how many solutions do you now have? You never divide out a variable. You use solutions. Do not divide a cosine out. The appropriate way to do this is to move everything to one side and factor out a cosine. So you get solutions where cosine is 0 and sine is 1 half. One half. All right, where's cosine 0? Just generally in terms of like 5 over 2, 3 pi over 2, and so on. But 3 pi over 2 is outside of the designated range. I think they said pi over 6 to 5 pi over 6, yeah? Okay. Uh, I will be here in 7th hour, and after school, I will also post my key online. Do not be foolish enough to just copy it. Have a nice day. Thank you. Let's get down to business. To defeat. Important knowledge.